morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class, uh, class on Christology. Uh, before we begin, we'll uh, pause for a word of prayer. So can uh, one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Sri Radha, can you lead us in prayer? The mic, Sri Radha. Morning, uh, good morning, Arila and Anthony. Thank you for joining class. Uh, we'll ask Sri Radha, one of our uh, in person students, to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Thank you, Sridhar. Okay, um, last week we were studying chapter seven. Okay, and um, we are basically trying to answer these questions: What is the purpose of the incarnation? Why did Christ have to become a man and take on the fullness of humanity? Uh, what was God doing through the humanity of Christ, which he could not do in any other means? Okay, so in chapter 7, we're basically trying to answer these three questions. And uh, we looked at various scripture passages uh, which help us to answer these questions that are in chapter 7. Okay, so we said that, you know, uh, because no one has seen God or can ever see God, he lives in unapproachable light. So the incarnation uh, was a means where, you know, God brought about his full, final, complete revelation uh, uh, in the person of Jesus Christ. So in the person of Jesus Christ, we have God's final and full revelation of the living God, which means... We are able to know the nature of God. We are able to know his works. Uh, we know who he is. And uh, it is also God revealing and speaking to man. So it is God manifested, you know, um, to us, which means that we can see him, we can experience him, we can touch him, you know, we can have a tangible experience with him. So that was um, one of the reasons why we see uh, you know, God became man, uh, incarnation, so that we can know who God is, we can know his nature, his attributes, uh, how he does uh, things, his work. And also, uh, Jesus Christ is the full and final revelation. That means everything that God wanted to reveal to mankind was revealed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Okay. And also about Christ's death, um, uh, another reason why. Uh, incarnation, why did God have to become man and take on the fullness of humanity? What was God doing to the humanity of Christ that he could not do through any other means? Was because, you know, uh, Jesus died, he, put, he was put to death in the flesh. Okay, if you look at various scripture references that we, we saw, all of the scripture references specifically mentioned that Jesus Christ was put to death in the flesh, which means. Uh, he was put to death in the human body. Uh, therefore, we see that his human body provided a means uh, for God to make that perfect, sinless sacrifice. Okay, so we see in the Old Testament that you know every time uh, the Israelites had to make an offering, okay, whether it was in the day of atonement or sin offering for what they have done, the lamb that they had to take was a perfect sinless, or sorry, perfect, spotless, without any flesh, okay? So no human being can die for the sins of mankind. No human being can die for your sins and my sins because we are all born in sin. We are all sinful. And that is why God had to become man and he had to come as a sinless being so that he can make that full, sufficient and perfect sacrifice he could be that sacrificial lamb uh, that was without blemish or spot 
and uh, hence he made a true sufficient perfect sacrifice for the sins of all humanity okay now because he made that true perfect uh, complete sacrifice for our sins you know we don't have to offer any more sacrifice no more sacrifices is needed everything is done it's complete it's perfect and what happened as a result of Jesus's sacrifice uh, offering himself as a true sufficient perfect sacrifice what happened we are made righteous we're made blameless uh, without guilt we're also presented holy and blameless without any accusation before the father we are justified in the father's eyes that means today when god sees you he looks at you just as if you have never seen isn't that amazing you know uh this morning it, this morning itself some of us would have committed some sins right but when we stand before god you know if i look at some of you uh you know and you've done something wrong and i look at you i remember those sins but imagine when we stand before god you know he looks as if just as if we have not sin isn't that so wonderful isn't that such a blessed truth uh, that we can you know live on and also uh, it should be something that helps us you know not to give in to uh, sin because the power of sin is already broken over our lives because of what jesus says that and through his death he reconciled god has reconciled man back to himself okay now we also look at two reasons why god sent his son in the likeness of human flesh we looked at romans chapter 8 uh, verses 3 and 4 we saw that god sent his son in the flesh so that he could become a sin offering okay and we i explained about the day of atonement right uh, and two things that we can learn from uh, you know why god sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh why did god have to become man okay why did he have to take on that flesh which is is sinful okay which is so prone uh, not sinful in the sense also it so has this weakness or the tendency to sin all of us have a weakness and tendency to sin to fall into sin to give into temptation it's because of the flesh that we uh, are in so god sent his son in the flesh that he could be that sin offering and uh, you know we uh, i explain about the day of atonement okay so in the same body which sin reigns where sin is very very uh, prominent uh, where the flesh is so weak the flesh gives in to um, the temptations and um, you know the cravings and the, the, the sinful, passions, sinful passions of the flesh you know, it's in the same flesh that Jesus came, and it's in the same flesh that he broke the power of sin. And it's in the same flesh that he did not yield to sin. It's in the same flesh that he did not yield to temptation. Okay? So he came so that he can be an example for us. That, okay, in the same environment that you are living in, this environment of this flesh that you are in, you know, when I can... As a human being, when I was 100% human, when I broke the power of sin and I didn't give in to, uh, you know, temptations or to sinful desires, uh, I didn't give in, uh, was not subjected to the dictates of the flesh, you know, uh, God is setting us an example and saying, you also can do that through the guidance and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying that, you know, in this flesh, I was able to keep the law right now the whole thing uh, even one of the reasons why god became man was so that you know he can set people free from the from the law okay from the bondage of the law from the curse of the law and i'll explain to that i'll explain to you what it means but he came to set us free but it's not that he came to abolish the law or you know to do away with the law but jesus said hey you people found it so difficult to keep the law you know, you found it so difficult to keep the law. And, you know, but here I am. I came to fulfill the law in the same flesh, which means that you can also keep the law. You can also overcome sin in the same flesh because, you know, I have set you an example. And you can do this to the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. 
so that is uh, what we looked at last. And then we began looking at the threefold purposes. Uh, okay, why did Jesus have to partake in the flesh and blood? Why did he have to have, you know, become fully human? Why did he have to have flesh and blood? Why did he have to share in our humanity? So we're looking at this passage in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, uh, which presents to us the three purposes for the incarnation and the consequences of it. So if you want to, if anyone asks you, why did God become man? What was the reason for God to come in flesh and blood? Why was it important for incarnation? So then you can turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. And then you can see three purposes for the incarnation um, and one consequences of it. So what are the three purposes you can find here? And you can also find one consequence. So can one of you please read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. We already began looking uh, at this, but we'll continue. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Thus much they have the children. Go ahead, read. Yeah, read, Nina. As the children of partition of the Amen. Thank you, Nina Santosh. So here we see three purposes for the incarnation in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. The first thing is that Christ shared in our humanity so that he could, you know, destroy the power of death. Okay. Uh, so he destroyed the power, the, he destroyed the one who had the power of death. Who had the power of death? Satan. Okay, so on the cross. Jesus destroyed Satan, he destroyed devil, he destroyed the power of sin and the power of death. And he fulfilled the Edenic covenant. Okay, where is the Edenic covenant? Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Okay, so we see that the seed of the woman will crush the, crush the head of the serpent. And we see that this prophecy is fulfilled because God had promised that the one who would crush the head of the serpent or the, or the devil would be from the seed of the woman. That means will be born of a woman. Okay. And uh, we also read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, uh, that Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. Okay. So not only did uh, Christ destroy the works of the devil through his death, but he also destroyed the devil himself. Okay, now the word destroy means what? To paralyze, to undo, to bring to nothing, to make to no effect. So destroy doesn't mean, you know, totally annihilate, totally dead. Satan is not totally dead. Okay, so can some people can pull out this verse and say when Jesus died on the cross, it says here that he destroyed the power of death, that is Satan, but Satan is still alive. Okay, so here what does the Greek word mean? It means... Uh, uh, to destroy means to undo. That means everything that Satan has done, uh, Jesus has undone his work. Okay, bring to nothing, bring to nothing uh, all of his schemes, his agendas, his plans, and to make to no effect his uh, plans and his agendas 
or whatever he he wants to do okay so satan is basically reduced to nothing okay so your enemy is actually the sum okay your enemy is actually having no power but it depends on you whether you empower him whether you give him the power or whether you are scared of him or you know you are traumatized by him or you, you know or you're living in fear about what he can do to your life but here we need to believe that you know jesus has destroyed every work scheme plan agenda of the enemy so where is the enemy now underneath that <laughs> okay <laughs> surprise is reduce satan's power to nothing and then there will be a time when he would finally throw him into eternal hell that is after um, uh, the millennium uh, rule thousand year rule when you know uh, satan will come again out of the abyss and then jesus there will be the final war and then he will throw him in eternal uh, fight Okay, so Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says, uh, can somebody read that please? Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. Anyone can read Colossians 2 15? Read, read. Yes, so here we see that he disarmed every principalities and powers, okay, and triumph over them. So if somebody says, hey, when Jesus says he died on the cross and he uh, destroyed uh, the power of uh, Satan and he destroyed Satan, then how can Satan be still alive when you turn to Colossians chapter 2 verse? 15 and show him show them that he has disarmed them only disarmed them disarmed means what the person is still alive but they have no power or they have no ammunition to fight against you so you can overpower them at any time you can throw them down any uh, times okay so the who who does these principalities and power refer to yes because Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 tells us that our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against, yes, but, but against the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. It's against the rulers and the authorities. Okay. So uh, on the cross, Jesus, you know, stripped Satan of all its power. Okay. And uh, he destroyed the power of uh, Satan. Now notice that Satan is defeated, you know, um, and um, you know, and Jesus destroyed him not as deity but as humanity. Okay, why do we say that he was not deity? That means he did not have the power of God or the nature of God that he used to destroy Satan. Why do we say that? Why do we say that when Jesus died on the cross, he disarmed Satan or he destroyed Satan because he was fully human and not because he used his divine nature? Why? Sorry? He's fully divine, he'll have the Zoe life, okay? He'll be omnipotent, yes. So what did he do? He refrained from exercising and expressing his nature of deity, God. What is the nature that he refrained from exercising or expressing? Omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. Okay? So that is what he refrained from using. So it was not because he was deity that he destroyed satan but it is through his humanity so what does it tell us it can also tell us that we can also disarm and destroy satan okay and when uh, christ defeated satan you know he was as a representative of the human race he represented you and me he was our captain okay he was our king now, when a captain or a king goes to fight against the enemy and the captain or the king kills the uh, the enemy king, what happens? 
victory is won, right? Does only the king experience a victory or the whole kingdom experience a victory? The whole kingdom experiences the victory. So he is a captain of our salvation, as it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. So when Jesus defeated the devil, he defeated him on our behalf. He shares his victory with um, us, and hence we also have the victory. Okay. Now the second thing that we can um, um the second thing that we can learn or the, the second purpose of the incarnation from Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 18 is that that having destroyed the devil Christ can now bring deliverance okay Hebrews chapter 2 uh, verse 15 can somebody read that you already read it but you can just read it once again Hebrews 2 15 Thank you. So when people have no assurance of salvation, what happens? They're afraid to die. Even for us, some of us who are already received salvation, that is something that can be uh, very traumatizing, can be very fearful, you know. Uh, so, but when Jesus died, you know, um, the, he broke the fear of death that is being that, that people are held bondage in. Okay, people were in bondage not only to uh, as slaves to sin and Satan, but also to death. So Jesus on the cross, he broke that power or that bondage to being slaves of death, and he released us from that tormenting uh, fear. Okay, so because of what Jesus did on the cross, and he died on the cross. You know, uh, we no longer have to live in fear of death. We don't need to live in subject of bondage, uh, bondage uh, in all our lives to the fear of uh, death. Okay, so this is a great news that we can share to the world. You know, people are so afraid to die, they're afraid what will happen to them after uh, death. But then you can just give them this wonderful news that when Jesus died on the cross. He also you know, set us free from the bondage of death. Now, the third purpose of incarnation that we see in Hebrews chapter 2 uh, uh, is uh, in verse 17. So, can one of you please read verse 17? Amen. Thank you. So here it says that Jesus became like us so that he can become our merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God. You know, so the first thing that why Jesus also, why incarnation, uh, why God became man, okay, or the whole purpose of incarnation was so that Jesus can identify with us, he can represent us. And also when he represented us on the cross, he won the victory so that we can share in that victory. Another reason or purpose of incarnation was so that he can become our faithful high priest. Now when the high priest, remember on the day of atonement, when he used to go into the Holy of Holies, he used to go and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, which is the half of the covenant. And he used to represent the all of the Israelites community. So one man going to the Holy of the Holies who represents the entire Israel uh, community. So when Jesus, he became that sacrificial lamb, he became that high priest who made that full sufficient perfect sacrifice. He had, he could represent us to God, okay, as that high priest. And even when he died and he, you know, rose again, he ascended back to heaven, now, what does the Bible say? That he's seated on the right hand of God and he is our interceding high priest. He's our high priest. So, you know, he's representing uh, even us before God. So every time we sin, you know, God's nature has not changed because what Jesus did on the cross. God's nature is every time we sin, sin has to be punished. So the wrath of God goes out, but Jesus is our great high priest. I'm just giving that, you know, like a just explaining it, you know, so Jesus the high priest and he says, you know, Father, I made, I made that sacrifice for Selena's sin, please forgive her. So what comes out is grace and 
forgiveness and not the wrath of God. So he became uh, the high priest, you know, offered the sacrifices on our behalf to atone for our sins and also to represent the people before God as our high priest so that we can uh, be, so that God can, you know, be reconciled back to his uh, people. So therefore we see in the incarnation, you know, Christ became one like us so that he can represent us before the Father as a compassionate and faithful high priest. That's why it says in Hebrews, uh, like we read here, you know, that, uh, he, you know, he's a, a, a sympathizing high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, who was, who was tempted in every way, just as we are, but yet without sin. So, you know, he can understand us, he can sympathize with us. That means he understands. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our uh, frailties. So he can sympathize or empathize uh, with us. Okay. So therefore, we see that incarnation made it possible to for us to have a high priest who could represent us before God in making that full sufficient perfect sacrifice. And also, you know, as a uh, represent us as a priest before God in terms of, you know, uh, being that compassionate and faithful high priest. Are you all able to understand? Yes? Okay. Look at what uh, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 says. Can somebody read that? 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. <clears throat> Yes, so here we have an advocate means what? And a lawyer who fights on behalf of us, somebody who intercedes on behalf of us, somebody who stands on behalf of us before the Father. Okay, so we see that, uh, you know, uh, Jesus Christ is a faithful high priest and also like an advocate, a lawyer, you know, who's our intercessor, who stands on behalf of us and intercedes on behalf of us. Intercedes means what? Father, please forgive her, you know, uh, I pay for her sins, have mercy, uh, forgiveness, you have grace, so compassion. And that is why we live in that period of grace and compassion and mercy and love because of what Jesus is doing on behalf of us in heaven. He is our interceding great high priest. Okay. Now one more aspect of the incarnation that we see in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 uh, to 16 um, is that, you know, we can, we can read this in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Can somebody read that please? Give it to Nina or uh, Sira or one of them can do it. We see that uh, you know in uh, incarnation, you know because Jesus lived as a man, he was fully man. He too was tempted. Okay, he uh, it was not that he was not tempted, but he was tempted. He understands you know temptation. He understands when he goes to temptation, and what happened? He overcame temptation. So now, as a faithful high priest, a compassionate, gracious, merciful. A faithful high priest, he's able to assist, he's able to help, he's able to aid those who are being tempted. So when you are going through temptation, you know, uh, you're not alone. You need to know that, you know, uh, Jesus who was tempted, he was tested, he was tried in every way, he overcame temptation, and he's there to help you, aid you, assist you, and relieve you from all temptation. Okay? So this is uh, what we look at the three um, 
you know, yeah, three purposes of incarnation that we looked in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Okay, and one consequence of it is that he is our faithful high priest and he's help, he's able to help us when we are tempted. Any questions? Uh, the next thing, you know, uh, why Jesus became incarnate, why incarnation was necessary, uh, was to redeem those under the law. Okay, to redeem all of us who are under the law. So let's look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Uh, can somebody read Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7? But when the fullness of the time was sent, for the one of the Okay, so here we see that, you know, in the fullness of time, God sent his Son in the right time, we've already learned that, studied that. Okay, so even though incarnation was for thousands of years, we see that in the in the appointed time, in the fullness of time, you know, in God's time, uh, God sent His Son. Now, in this passage, you know, we see another purpose of the incarnation. Another purpose of incarnation, or the many that we have studied so far. Another reason is that Christ came. To redeem those who are under the law so that we can receive adoption as sons. Okay, now to understand this, let's uh, look briefly at the background of uh, uh, the Paul's epistle to uh, the church at Galatia. Now, Galatia is a region in Asia Minor and it, uh, it has regions, uh, you know, in Galatia, there are different cities like uh, Antioch, Lystra, Derby. Iconium, and uh, in, in these churches, in this uh, cities, or in this region of Galatia, uh, there were many churches, and uh, you know, the, the problem during Paul's time was when, when Paul was living in the early church was that many of these Jews were becoming Christians. They're coming to faith. Okay, Paul was one of them. He was a Jew who was coming to faith. So when they come to into faith, they tell these Gentiles, you know, that there are Jews and Gentiles, right? They tell the Gentiles, hey, you, uh, salvation is only not through faith in Jesus Christ, but you also have to follow the laws. You also have to keep the rituals and the covenants. So one of the covenants that they were imposing or putting on the Gentiles is they have to be circumcised. He said, only if you're circumcised, then you can, you become the daughter, son and daughter of Abraham, and you receive the blessing of Abraham, okay? And so they were putting all of these laws, and they were bringing about the rituals or kind of food they have to eat, you know, how they have to dress, you have to put all these tassels, you know, the, the Jews had the, 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 the word on their forehead, and they had in their, you know, the side thing, and all of that, and they would stand on the corner of the street and pray. So all of these rituals, they were bringing it into the church, and they were burdening these Gentiles, and also they were burdening them about the circumcision ritual or the covenant of circumcision. And that is why you can read most of Paul's letters. He will always mention about, um, you know, uh, this. And uh, because Paul was, you know, not giving in to that the Gentiles have to be circumcised. He was not making it mandatory. He was saying, no, this is not required for the Gentiles. The Jews, the Jewish Christians, the Judaizers, they started saying that, you know, Paul is not an apostle and that he is an, you know, inferior uh, to other apostles. And so when Paul writes his letters, he always you know, starts by defending his apostleship. Okay. He always says, you know, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, which means that he is made an apostle not by his own will or his own choosing, but it was God's will, to, or it was God who chose him to become an apostle. And if you look at his epistles, whether he is in Romans or First Timothy, Second Timothy, he always says, my gospel, my gospel, my gospel. 
to if you read this epistle very clearly in Romans, first Timothy, second Timothy, he always mentions that my gospel. He does not say the gospel, but he says my gospel because he's wanting to tell people that hey, the gospel that I received was not that something I learned from you know from the other apostles. And in those days we know that they did not have the you know the Torah or the whole Bible in their hands. Okay, he says that it was my gospel it's because Jesus Christ Himself, or the Holy Spirit Himself, revealed it to me or taught it to uh, me. So he's saying that you know he received this gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and not from other apostles. Okay, and then in chapter three of uh, uh, the, the Epistle of Galatians, Paul declares how a Gentile becomes Christians or comes to faith in Christ Jesus uh, and become also a descendant of Abraham, not by keeping the circumcision ritual, but by faith in God or faith in Christ Jesus. And he very beautifully says this because he says, even if you study his, uh, his episode to the Church of Rome, the Book of Romans, he says, you know, in, uh, in chapter six, uh, 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 I think in chapter six and chapter seven, he discusses there if you look at Romans, um, you know, um, sorry, Romans chapter four. He says in Romans chapter four, he says, you know, how did Abraham, how was Abraham made righteous before God? How was Abraham justified by, justified before God? Because of his faith, okay, because of his so even before God gave him that circumcision ritual, okay, which was a covenant of his blessings, okay, even before that he was justified before God, he was made right before God, how? Because of his faith and not because of that circumcision ritual. So he keeps writing in over and over again in his epistles and saying, Abraham, because they, you know, the, the Jews, they held Abraham in great regard and because of the covenant that God made with Abraham, the covenant of the circumcision. And so he says, Abraham was justified by faith even before God gave the circumcision ritual. God told him, leave your father's household, go to the land and flee. And because he obeyed and went, he was all justified by faith. So all who believe by faith, all who believe by faith in Christ Jesus will receive the blessing of Abraham. Because it's only when you receive, when you believe by faith that you are made justified or you're made righteous and not the circumcision of the ritual. Okay. And then he goes on to say that, you know, he goes on to say that uh, uh, the law was intended only as an, uh, you know, intermediary or a disciplinary system and Christ came to end the law, which means, does not mean that Christ came to do away with the law. That means now because we are on the new covenant, we are, you know, on the New Testament believers, so to say, the Ten Commandments, the laws that God has given in the Old Testament, it does not work anymore in our lives. No. We real clearly see Jesus saying he did not come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. Okay, so when you're saying that, you know, the law was intended only as an intermediary or a disciplinary system and Christ came to end the law, it means that, you know, uh, Christ came to do away with the curse or the condemnation of the law. You know, the law condemned the people. Now, why did God give the, the, the law to the Israelites. Now, if you read Romans chapter 7, I want you to listen carefully, okay, because it's very important for you to understand this. In Romans chapter 7, you know, uh, uh, Paul very elaborately, elaborately, he explains, the elaborate way he explains about the law. He says the law is not evil. He says the law is good, it served a purpose. What is the purpose of the law? God gave the law. If God gave the law, it cannot be bad. And because God gave the law, it does not mean Jesus came and said, oh, the law is bad, it's not right. He, he came to abolish the law. No. 
Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, he says that the law had a specific purpose. And what was the purpose of the law? The law was given so that it can make us aware of sin. It can show us where we have missed the mark, where we have gone away from uh, God. Without the law, nobody will know that, you know, we have done something wrong. So Paul is writing in Romans chapter 1, he says, for those who do not have the law, what is the law? Their conscience is the law. So you can't say, hey, Gentiles, how can God judge them because they do not have the law, they don't know what is right and wrong. Okay, the Jews can be judged because they have the law, they know what is right and wrong. But Paul is saying that those who do not have the law of God, okay, the Torah, the Old Testament laws, they can't say, hey, we, can't, we don't have the law, so God they cannot judge us. But God is saying, you know, your own conscience is that law. Okay, so the law was given so that we can become aware of sin. We can know what is right, we can know what is wrong, we know when we have broken the law and what we need to do. So the law basically exposes our sin. It basically shows our sinful uh, desires. It shows us uh, that we are weak in the flesh, that we are sinful in the flesh. But then in verse, that is in verse 7, he, he says that. But in verse 12 and 14, in Romans chapter 7, Paul says that the law is holy, it is just and good, verse 12 of Romans chapter 7. And in Romans chapter 14, he said the law is spiritual because it is given by God. So the law is not bad, the law is good, it's just, it's holy, uh, it's spiritual, it's given to us by the uh, uh, by God. And the law also served a purpose. What is that purpose? It actually pointed out to the Savior. How does the law point out to the Savior? Now people are trying to keep the law and they're not able to keep the law. Right? Because they're not able to keep the law, what is happening to them? They are, they are, they are being punished. Okay? Or they have to make a sacrifice for sin. So they are so bound by this. They become so much slaves of it, you know, they're not able to keep it, they're so frustrated, and then, you know, they just go and make some kind of offering and all of that. And so they're looking for some way where they can be delivered from this law, some way that someone can help them or save them from keeping the law. And that is why God promises them towards the end of the Old Testament. He says, I will remove that heart of stone, give you out of flesh, I'll write my laws upon your heart and mind, and I'll put my Holy Spirit, my Holy Spirit will help you to keep the uh, laws. So actually the law, you know, uh, you know, serve its part in pointing out our sin, and it also serve its part in pointing out to a Savior, who will deliver them from the curse of the law. Why curse of the law? Because the law brought curse on the people. Why? It brought condemnation on the people. Condemnation means what? I you know I can't keep the law. I'm, I'm not holy. It cannot be good. I cannot be right before God. And why did the law bring about curse? Because, you know, what was God's, this one? Even if you break one law, it's like you've broken all the 630 laws and the Ten Commandments. Right? So even if you break one small law, it's like you've broken everything. And because you have broken everything, you have inherited the so they were looking for somebody to deliver them from this curse, from this bondage of the law. So the law was actually pointing out to, uh, to Jesus uh, Christ. And the law was good. It served a purpose. It made us aware of sin. But the more it made us aware of sin, you know, the more we want to break it. And that is what Paul is writing in, in Romans chapter 6 and in, in verse 7. You know, he says, uh, uh, you know, um, he says, you know, the more I want to do good, I'm not able to do it. The bad that I don't want to do, I end up uh, doing it. So, you know, he says that why do we break the law? Because sin is dwelling in me. My flesh is good for nothing because it is controlled by the power of sin. So he says, he's writing in, in, in these chapters in Romans, he says, the law of sin is working in my flesh. Now, when you read in scripture, now listen carefully, when you read in scripture, you know, uh, phrases like this, the law of sin, the law of death, the law of uh, the spirit of Christ, or the law of the spirit, 
It does not mean the law, though it does not mean the Old Testament laws, but here the law of sin, or the law of death, or the law of the spirit means the power, the controlling power, the dominion, the reign of sin. So when you say the law of sin, it means the control, the power, the reign of sin. When you say the law of death, it means the control, the dominion, the reign, or the power of death. When you say the law of the spirit of life, it means the control of the dominion or the power of the spirit of life. So in those phrases, when you see the law of death, the law of sin, it does not mean the law of God, which God gave us. So that does not mean the law of God causes us to sin. That doesn't mean that the law of God, you know, brings about death. It's talking about the control, the power, the reign, the dominion of sin or death. Did you get it? But in other places where you, you see law, you need to interpret in that context, it can mean the Old Testament laws that God has given a people. So he says, why can't, you know, I do away with sin? Even if I don't want to sin, why do I end up sinning? It's because sin is dwelling in me. My flesh is weak because the law of sin is working in my flesh. Or the power, dominion, reign of sin is working in my flesh. Sin is a law. Sin is a power, a force, a dominion, a reign that is controlling my body. Okay, so that is what he's explaining in Romans. Now, coming back to Galatians, after under understanding the whole concept of law, Paul explains in Galatians that the law, in fact, served in preserving the people through whom the Savior would come. Okay. So the law actually preserved them, it made them aware of sin, but also preserved them, uh, you know, uh, through whom the same nation of Israel, a savior would come, who would help them to overcome the curse of the bondage of the uh, law, okay? So the law has been established, means what? The law has made to, up, was, is upheld, up, upheld or made to stand in the person and work of, Jesus Christ. So how is the law upheld or made to stand in the person of Jesus Christ? If we look at that, okay? So having said this, that the law is not the real problem, but sin that rules and dominates the flesh and the members of our body. So the law was required so that people, you know, required people to do things in the flesh. Now the law, when you, wherever you read, the law is was weak. Does not mean that God's law is weak. The law is weak, which means the law did not give us the strength, the ability, the help to keep the law. That is why when you read in passages of scripture when it says the law was weak or the law is weak, it does not mean that God's laws are weak. No, God's law is holy, good, perfect. But when we read that God's law is weak, it means that the law was just given to the people. But the law did not give the people the strength, the help, the aid to keep the law, to fulfill the law, or to meet the righteous requirements of the law, which was why it was impossible for people to keep the law, and which was why sin continued to dominate in the flesh. And because of that, you know, the law made sin more noticeable. So your, your sin is more noticeable because you have broken the law. Everybody knows that. And so the law only further exposed the weaknesses of the flesh, but it did not give people the strength or the aid or the help, uh, you know, to keep the flesh. And that's why when Jesus came in the flesh, he helped us to keep the law of truth. Okay. We'll come back after the break. We'll stop here and then we'll come back after the break and we'll continue. Okay. Thank you, everyone.